Now we often have situations people will say, well, how do you know that Neighborhood Watch works? We have an example of a new Neighborhood Watch that started in Pickering a few summers ago. Just a small little community like this, 89 homes. It was two dead-end courts running off of Fairport Road. This little community had 10 break and enters one summer. That's huge, 10 out of 89 in one summer. They were feeling very afraid. So they came to us and they asked us to help them establish a neighborhood watch just like you are. And they got trained in crime prevention, community safety, lighting up the fronts of their homes, trimming back the shrubs, all those good things to make easy sight lines. And then they started to go out and actually walk the streets, like actually go for walks and interact with their neighbors. And you know, if they saw a strange vehicle, jot down the license plate. Soon enough, the bad guys figured out that that was not a safe place for them anymore. All right. The next summer, statistically, their break and enters went from 10 to 1. And that one was actually called in and was preventable, except that the way that the person called it in, it came through as looked like a parking complaint. So don't be afraid to use the word suspicious vehicle. All right. Is someone parking in the area? I'm not sure. We've had some break and enters. We got some training. Please come and check it out. All right. Now, I'm not naive enough to be able to uh, say 100% that the whole reason that their break and enter rate went from 10 to 1 is strictly just because of the neighborhood watch. There could be any number of factors, right? Bad guys could be in jail or they could have moved on to more lucrative area, any number of things. But I would like to think that the fact that they had made their neighborhood less attractive to break and enters was a part of the reason that their crime went down. Also, they ended up with a stronger community. And here's how we know. The following January, it was a Friday, it was a PA day from school. We got a phone call in our communications from one of the block captains. Now this lady lived at the end, not the bulb end of the court, but the mouth end of the court, okay? She happened to be in her living room. She saw a car come screaming down into the court, turn around and come out and park in front of her house, facing towards Fairport Road. Four young people got out of that and w went running across the other side of Fairport Road into the Duncannon community on the other side. Okay, just doesn't seem right, does it? People don't, generally speaking, park in one community and then run into another community. So she was just, her spidey sense was tingling. And she didn't really know what to do about it, otherwise it was a suspicious vehicle call at that point. And she waited until it was safe. She didn't put herself in any danger. And she went and, uh, 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 checked out, got the car license plate, okay, and then she called it into us. Told the communicator exactly what she had seen. Now, the communicator at this point didn't have anything other than suspicious vehicle information, and so we had officers, you know, uh, aware of this, but at this point, nothing to go on. Unbeknownst to anybody, on the other side of Fairport Road, in a home in the other community, a young person was home from school on his PA day, 13 year old. Now, what are 13-year-olds generally doing at 11.30 a.m. on a PA day? Sleeping, right? <laughs> so, guess what? These thugs broke into his house, tied him up, pistol whipped him. They were actually looking for his brother trying to settle a drug debt, all right? This young person didn't have anything to do with it, but he was the victim of this, break or this home invasion. And no, those young people after they'd finished that, went running back over. So here's our lady, our neighborhood watch lady. She's at the front window, and it's like less than an hour later, she sees these four young people come running back, jump in the vehicle, and head north at a screaming rate up Fairport Road. So now she calls in and says, I, I don't know what's going on, but I just want to let you know the vehicle's left, and they've gone northbound on Fairport Road. It isn't until the other youngster was able to free himself and call the police that they were able to put two and two together, all right? But the description of the clothing that he was able to give matched the description of the clothing that the block captain had given, and they caught the kids in the same clothes, and they were able to prosecute charges for them. All because one lady listened to her instincts and made the phone call. When many people wouldn't have, they would have shrugged it off and thought, that's weird, okay? If you get a that's weird moment, and you think in your head, maybe I should call the police? Do it, okay? We would rather know about it and check it out. It turns out to be nothing than if 
you don't call it in and it turns out later that they've broken into that house, right? Now a couple of safety tips. If you should come home to your house and you find that the house is insecure and you could have sworn you locked that door, but the door is ajar, please do not go in. All right, we do not want you to accidentally walk in on something or someone that might be in there. Rather, go to a safe place, go to your car, go to your neighbor's house, call 911. My house is insecure. I'm not sure if there's anyone in there or not. We will respond. We will come and clear the house and make sure there's no one in there. The other thing you could do is you could contaminate a crime scene if you walk into that, right? Even if someone isn't in there. So we want you to be safe. So don't walk into an insecure premise if you're sure you left it locked, all right? Another thing is, if you're home alone and someone is knocking persistently or ringing the doorbell, and you know, maybe you're up to your elbows in flour because you're baking, or you're changing the baby, or you're, you're doing a painting job, or you're trying to sleep because you work shifts, and it's just annoying, and you don't want to answer the door because of, you know, someone coming around selling you something, right? It is important, however, that you let them know that you're home. So you don't have to open the door to everybody who comes to the door. But it is important to let that person who's consistently ringing your doorbell or knocking at your door that there's someone home. Holler through the door if you like, you know. I can't come to the door right now, I'm busy. Come back later. My hot water heater's fine. Whatever you want to say, okay? Just let them know there's someone home. And that means that they won't come to the wrong conclusion that the house is empty and they break into your house. Because this is what happens, that's their modus operandi, is they go, they knock, they ring the doorbell, they go around the back. If you are the neighbor and you see that happening, you're looking out that window and you see that happening, someone going around the back, you're calling 911, right? Okay? But if you're home alone, make your presence known. Very important. We want you to be safe. Something you can do to be safe is to keep your car keys in your bedroom at night, okay? Obviously, you're gonna lock all your doors because people do break into homes at night too, and they will check your doors, but take your car keys up to bed with you. A lot of people forget to lock their car doors. An astonishing number of people leave valuables in their car, like GPSs. How much do those things cost? Two, 300 bucks of your hard-earned cash, right? Wallets stereos, uh, purses, ladies, ladies, don't leave your purse in the car, okay? Laptops, we had a report of someone who was doing a fundraiser, $700 of cash from the school fundraiser in the car that they left unlocked that got stolen from their car. I had one person say to me, I can't believe what a coincidence it was. I lock my car every night. And the one night I left it unlocked was the night they broke in. I said to her lady, that was no coincidence at all. They have been trying your car door handle every night for the last 30 nights. And that's what they do, it's called car hopping. And it just so happened that was the night you forgot to lock it. And so they got in. It's not random. They are going through every neighborhood in Durham region every night trying door handles. So if you get up in the night to get a drink of water and you happen to see someone out there monkeying around with cars or going up and down the street, you do two things. Call 911, all right? The other thing is, what do we all have on this, uh, on, on our car clicker? A panic button. So when you're looking down and you see someone out in the driveway looking into cars, you hit that thing. Now all of a sudden it's going beep, beep, beep. It's drawing attention. That guy's going to be out of there fast, okay? So another thing is a lot of older people keep their, uh, their car keys with them because if they fall down or they, you know, can't get up out of the, uh, you know, out of the chair or out of their uh, bed, then they can hit that and that uh, can call 911 or let their family know. Even if it makes the car horn go, it'll eventually draw the neighbor's attention and they'll come and check it out, make sure that person is okay. Now the other thing on there is the little clicker to lock your car door. So make that part of your nighttime routine. We know we all get busy, right? We come in to the house with bags of groceries, we're juggling the kids and everything like that. And what do we do when we come in that door? Where does the purse go? Oh yeah, I know, just inside the door, on that harvest table, or maybe the bottom step, on the kitchen table, within six feet, 
of your front door. Think about what's within six feet of your front door, all right? Now I just watched you going in your house with your arms full of groceries and, and I figure, okay, they're in the back of the house putting the, key, uh, putting the groceries away. They're going to, I'm, I'm gonna go and step inside that hallway and what can I reach? Have you got one of those little key holder things just inside your back door where you hang the keys up or do you throw them in a bowl on the harvest table or whatever? Please get out of that habit. It's making it way too easy for the criminals. We need to make it harder for them, okay? Let it at least be a challenge for them. I have to, as I'm getting older, come up with little ways of remembering things. So one of the things I've had to train myself to do as soon as I get in the house, very first thing before I even take my shoes off is I take that purse upstairs and around the corner so it's nowhere near. Because when they grab your purse, ladies, what have they got? everything yeah your wallet your id your car keys your house keys and you know what how about that door between your garage and the inside door from the garage into your house do you consistently lock that that's good if you do a lot of people don't because you know what they just figure well the car garage door is locked or closed so i'm safe right but you know people steal garage door openers and they go up and down the streets, pointing them at different houses until they find one that it opens. And they'll just hit one. And you could either be home or not home. You might be asleep at night. And guys, I know you all don't leave your wallets on the kitchen counter or the top of the fridge, right? Okay, <laughs> because lots of guys do that. And so what, are, what is gonna happen? They're gonna come in through that door between your garage into your house. And again, now they've got your wallet. They've got maybe your car keys. Your car is sitting there in the garage and they're gone, all right? It's too easy. Don't make it so easy for them.